Hello everyone and welcome to another co-video. I'm Alex, your everyday neighborhood epidemiologist, coming to talk to you about vaccines. Vaccines are the most surefire way that we can create widespread immunity in a population. And if most of the population is immune without them having to die, then we get herd immunity. We can go on living our lives like normal. We can take off our masks. We could pretend all of this never happened. So what's going on with these vaccines? You know, we've been in this for almost a year, guys. This has been kind of insane. And everyone is just counting down the days for this vaccine to appear. And I'm hearing a lot of word from people who don't want to take the vaccine because they're scared of potential long-term effects. So is this a cause for concern? Yes and no. Depends on what your country's method of enforcement is, of health and safety measures, of ethical research, political corruption could kind of sink its teeth into this whole deal because there is a lot of money involved in producing an effective vaccine. So why don't we just dive in, shall we? So the New York Times has a really, really good overview page that updates regularly about what's going on with the myriad vaccines that are in various stages of production. So first I want to talk about what a vaccine really is. So the goal of a vaccine is not to cure a disease because vaccines can't do that. Because once you have the disease, you have the disease. There really isn't much you can do. Vaccines prevent the disease among those who are not yet infected to prevent them from getting infected. And it doesn't necessarily have to be 100%, but it has to be effective enough to either create herd immunity, so it has to work in enough people for it to lead to herd immunity, or it has to reduce the severity of the disease in those who catch it enough that we hardly have anyone going in the ICU so that the disease is no longer a fear or a big danger, kind of like what we see with the flu vaccine. So while it does work in over 50% of cases, in those that it doesn't work, if they do get the flu vaccine, it is always very mild. Almost always. So right now we have 54 vaccines in various stages and phases of clinical trials. So I'm going to give you a little insider's perspective of what's happening. So how do you make a vaccine? Well, first of all, in order to do so, you have to um, map the viral genome, or at least to some degree, you have to find a part of the viral DNA or viral protein that is unique to that virus. Because you want to make sure that when your body produces antibodies, it is just to the disease and not to a protein in your own body. <laughs> Then you move on to phase zero, what some people call preclinicals. So there are currently 87 vaccines that are in this stage of production, and it's not really counted as part of the clinical trials because they're not, they're preclinical. So this is what happens when you test the vaccine on cells, just kind of like in a test tube or something, and animals. So if animals produce antibodies, then you go to phase one. One eternity later. Phase one are the safety trials. You give it to a very small number of people and see if they produce antibodies at various doses. So you want to see what dose works. If there are no adverse effects, then you move to phase two. So there are currently 38 vaccines in phase one of clinical trials. Several months later. Now we move on to phase two. So this is called expanded trials. So with each phase, you just have more and more people being tested. And what you want to get out of phase two, ideally, is hundreds of people split into groups. So you want to see, like, does the vaccine work better on a certain group of people and not in others? Does it work better in men or in women, elderly versus young people? Does it work in people with pre-existing conditions, etc, etc, etc. So if it produces an immune response and doesn't have any adverse effects, then you move on to phase three. So currently there are 17 vaccines in phase two right now. Eight semesters later. Now we're moving on to phase three. Phase three is called efficacy trials. So there are thousands of people in these trials. They're huge studies. 
And we already know that they don't kill people right off the bat anyway. So usually you have a lot of people that are ready to volunteer. You know, I always see these ads on Facebook for, you know, various phases of clinical trials for a vaccine study, and it seems that the amount that they pay the participants goes down with each phase because it's less risky. Efficacy trials, basically what that means is you compare it to the placebo. So what that's called is it's a randomized control trial. Control is the placebo, and that means 3,000 people the vaccine and 3,000 people like a saline injection. And then they compare the results. They compare serum antibodies. They also want to see if there are any side effects. Obviously, if there are side effects in the placebo, then you know pretty darn well that it's not because of the vaccine. So basically what they want to see is, first of all, the sample is now large enough to see the small, rare side effects, and the metric they use to determine if it should be approved or should be considered for approval is if it's over 50% effective. So if more people become immune to COVID than not, then it generally moves to limited approval. So right now, there are 12 vaccines that are phase three clinical trials. Finally, we move on to limited approval. Limited approval means that the government approves it conditionally. So generally what happens is we're still monitoring the results of the phase three trials. It's not a good idea to approve it too prematurely because what happens is you want to make sure there are no adverse effects or at least limited adverse effects and you want to make sure that it actually works. You also want to make sure that there aren't any long-term risks. Russia and China have actually given limited approval to a few but that's kind of risky. So in the world, so far, there are six vaccines that are in the limited approval phase, rolling out the vaccine. We're rolling out the vaccine. We're focusing on the people who are the most at risk. So how do we streamline this? Because of course, these phases take years. They take such a long time. And we don't have all that time because we can only stay cooped up in our houses for so long. The economy has taken a nosedive and it probably can't afford to be in this position for much longer. There are a few ways that we can streamline this process during a medical emergency, which right now would definitely qualify because the economy is in a standstill. So we can prematurely approve a vaccine, which a lot of countries have done due to the severity of the disease. So if we feel that the risk of getting COVID is more and the risk of the long-term vaccine effects that we are concerned about, then a government committee can give it limited approval. Up to four years later. So again, the researchers are still monitoring the effects of the vaccine, and this is called emergency use authorization. So the vaccine is technically still in clinical trials. There's actually a few vaccines that the U.S. government is considering giving this designation. So another thing that they can do, and this is again being done, it's a horrible situation. They want to get out of it as soon as possible. So in order to speed it up, they put like phases one and two together or two and three together. So instead of first trial being just a handful of people to just make sure it doesn't kill people, they would make the first trial be like hundreds of people. And then you just test the stuff that you would test for in phase one and phase two at the same time. The problem with this is that it's a huge risk. Like, could you imagine injecting hundreds of people with a vaccine that's only been tested on animals so far? That's nuts. It's a very common thing combined phases one and two in developing countries where people really need the money and are desperate because of the economic situation in many of these countries. <laughs> But more commonly, people combine phases two and three, because at this point, you know, you know it doesn't really kill people all that much in the preliminary trials. After testing maybe like 20 people, they think, okay, let's test like 2,000 people, because the 20 people are okay, so how bad could it be, right? As I said, phase three is a good way of pointing out a lot of the rare side effects, so if there is a relatively common side effect that just so happened to be missed or not present in the phase one trial, then 
you can find out the hard way, and that's not a fun way to find out. But we see quite a few vaccines that are combining phase two and three to streamline things, and that would make sense, really. One eternity later. That's when phase three is over. You have the results, the long-term results, whatever, and it's given approval. We know it works, and we got a vaccine. So what happens when you see issues, when you see adverse effects at any point? So an adverse effect is basically a side effect, like a bad thing that happens. So like if somebody gets like a really high fever, the trial gets paused. Another thing that would pause the trial is if it's determined that the vaccine only lasts like a week. You know what I mean? So you see that, oh, the vaccine seems to be working. And then a week later, it doesn't work anymore. Or even if it's like just a couple months, they would probably pause it. So that's why we do these long-term trials. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see y'all next.